Thank you all so much for joining us for booting your OS across the NVMe over Fabrics Transport, NVMe Boot Specification, and Boot over NVMe TCP Reference Implementation Webinar. Uh, we wanted to take a minute here to introduce you to our presenters today. So we have Phil Caton, who is a Senior Staff Software Engineer at Intel, Rob Davis, who's the VP of Storage Technology at NVIDIA, and then Doug Farley, who's a Distinguished Engineer at Dell Technologies. And then I'll pass it off to the presenters for a quick overview of the agenda and the slides. Hello, and uh, thank you um, for joining us for this hopefully interesting talk on a coming new capability for NVMe over fabrics. I'm uh, Rob Davis, and uh, along with Phil and Doug, um, we are going to explain how you will soon be able to boot Ethernet attached computers across a network with NVMe over fabrics. This capability is often called boot from sand. Here is how our talk is gonna break down. I'll start out and explain where in the NVMe specification, booting fits and how we leverage iSCSI technology to kickstart and speed, and speed up the spec work, the spec development. Phil will then take over to cover how the NVMe boot spec fits into the U, EFI, and DMTF ecosystem. And then Doug will bring us home with an example design. So let's get started. First, some background on NVMe Express on industry on the NVMe Express industry organization that was started many years ago to develop a high performance interface for SSDs. You may remember in the beginning, SSDs were connected to computers with SAS or satellite like hard drives were. NVMe Express changed all that with an industry-wide standard interface for connecting them over PCIe that is ubiquitous today. The standard was then expanded to add support for connecting NVMe SSDs across a network, and that was called NVMe over fabrics. As the slide shows, the standard is supported by more than 110 members across the spectrum of IT vendors and their customers. It's broken up into five main parts, which cover the basics, the basic interfaces um, to it, um, network transports for the fabrics, and management, uh, and then booting. And it's pretty um, easy to guess where, where our group fits in. And finally, you can see on the bottom of the slide how the new capabilities the NVMe standard has brought to IT products has impacted applications across the industry. Here is the NVMe family of specifications. Um, we are on version two. There's a base specification, a collection of command set specifications, transports, and management. The NVMe command set is what people usually think of when looking at a standard and describes traditional block storage. There is a collection of transport specifications, and this is somewhat unique about NVMe. Unlike some standards, which define the protocol and the wire it runs on, NVMe over fabrics is transport independent. It can run on PCIe, Ethernet, fiber channel, and InfiniBand wires, or fibers today. And there is no reason other transports couldn't be added. The boot specification we're going the boot specification we are going to go into detail on here is, of course, um, the newest member to the family of specs. These specifications are maintained and enhanced inside the mvme.org by task groups. The boot task group currently has members from 34 companies and is growing. And if you're a member of nvme.org and want to join us, you're interested, um, please come on. We have uh, plenty of work to do and 
Um, we're happy to have more members help. Doug, Phil, and myself are the co-chairs for this um, group. So why did Dell, Intel, NVIDIA, and many other companies like Red Hat, HPE, VMware, SUSE, and there's more, 34 of us, um, work to make this new specification happen? Frankly, it's because this was a missing capability that NVMe over Fabric needs to take its place as the language for network storage. It allows a standardized, meaning multi-vendor, way for you to boot your computer from OS images stored on the other side of the network. This is critical for large deployments for many reasons. Think about the difficulty of upgrading the operating system in a data center um, across all of the servers, even just 100. Instead of having to push a new OS or even patches to all those machines, with Network Boot, you just do it in one place. And this is only one of many values this technology brings. The goal of this new specification is standardizing booting from NVMe and NVMe over Fabric namespaces. NVMe is in fact, NVMe is in fact already in widespread use for booting from PCIe transport. What, of course, we needed to add was over Fabric's boot. In order to speed the development and standardization of booting over NVMe over Fabric's, we started with TCP transport and leveraged the groundwork of booting over iSCSI. Remember those early SSDs I mentioned that leveraged hard drive protocols like SAS? Well, the S in SAS stands for SCSI a legacy storage protocol developed for hard drives, and iSCSI is SCSI protocol inside TCP over Ethernet. We not only leverage the TCP transport from iSCSI, but also the operating system handover mechanism called iSCSI boot firmware table, or IBFT. IBFT contains information shared between the BIOS and the pre-boot environment and the operating system. As you can see, we also leveraged the high-level architecture of the iSCSI boot specification, including the boot flow handover mechanism. In the NVMe boot technical group, we developed a similar mechanism like IBFT called NVMe boot firmware table or NBFT. We know this picture takes some liberties. However, it is meant to help those familiar with boot over iSCSI to understand how we leveraged it for boot over NVMe over fabrics. And now I'm going to turn it over to Phil to go deeper into the pre-OS boot flow in the IETF environment. 
apologize, apologize for that. Let me start over. <laughs> so thanks, Rob. Uh, the NVMe book specification was published on the NVM Express organization website in December of last year. It has now taken its place as part of the NVMe family of specifications. And you can sort of see a family photo on the right with all the members of the specification family represented. The goal of the NVMe boot specification is to standardize booting from local and remote NVMe namespaces. The boot specification defines constructs and guidelines for booting from NVMe interfaces over NVMe supported transports. The initial version of, this, of the specification, it concentrates on defining extensions to the NVMe interfaces for booting over fabrics, especially the TCP transport. It has a normative section, which includes general concepts for NVMe booting and mechanics such as ACPI tables to enable the pre-OS and OS environments to share configuration context between them. It has an informative section, which introduces the boot stages and flow in a UAFI pre-OS environment. The informative section also includes best practices for reliable OS consumption of pre-boot configuration and OS and fabric specifics. The boot specification is a complex multi-component system that's comprised of elements from pre-OS firmware and software configuration exchange, uh, OS tools and applications, and system configuration mechanisms. And as such, it is comprised of more than one standard and required cooperation of multiple ecosystem standard partners, as I'll go into in the next few slides. First, in cooperation with the UAFI forum, we developed the specification content to enable boot software for the UAFI and ACPI environments. And the next slide goes into more detail. First, we developed specification content for ACPI to add an ACPI NVMe boot firmware table that Rob mentioned. And this enhanced the description header signature, signature table to add the NBFT signature, which is leveraged by the NVMe boot specification. We also added a new messaging device path extension for NVMe over fabrics booting to the UEFI system specification, as you can see on the table here. And this includes a new subtype, as well as the namespace identifier type, the namespace identifier, and the subsystem NQN that uniquely identifies the namespace for the device path. Next, in order to facilitate the exchange of secrets and credentials for common NVMe over fabrics connections that's utilized by both pre-OS boot and the OS, the, uh, the existing Redfish Secrets Registry was extended to support NVMe over fabrics authentication and transport security credentials, as we'll see on the next slide. What we needed was a place to share secrets between the pre-OS and OS environments. And so we added standardization for NVMe over fabrics in DMTF's uh, Redfish release 2021.4. Specifically, three things were added. First, the NVMe over fabrics key type. Second of all, a corresponding secure hash allow list, which defines which algorithms are allowed with the usage of the key, such as SHA-256 or SHA-384 or SHA-512. And third, a table which defines which security protocol this particular key uses, such as Diffie-Hellman message authentication or transport layer security pre-shared key or an OEM specific key. Along with these efforts, the NVMe boot task group developed the NVMe boot standard, which starts with booting over NVMe TCP. It has the capability to be amended in the future revisions to cover other capabilities, such as booting over NVMe-based media from other transports, which Doug will address later on in this presentation. And the next slide covers the architecture of the descriptor language for booting over, over NVMe TCP, and the rest of the talk discusses the creation of, uh, by a subset of the NVMe boot task group members of a public reference implementation to be released under mostly a BSD3 clause with the goal of integrating it into upstream projects. As Rob discussed previously, the NBFT is a mechanism to hand off configuration data from the pre-OS driver, the UEFI driver, to the OS. The pre-OS administrator configures subsystem NQNs, IP addresses, namespaces, a security-related information, that sort of thing, into a pre-OS environment, UEFI. The pre-OS drivers are responsible then for taking the administrative configuration and creating any connectivity that is required to namespaces. It then populates one or more NBFTs. And this information is presented to the OS as it starts to come up in an NBFT ACPI table as sort of a one-way means of communication, if you will, from the pre-OS environment to the runtime operating system. As you can see from the figure on the right, the NBFT consists of really three major elements, the header, 
the control descriptor, and the host descriptor. Optionally, you can provide extended details uh, to the OS through population of several other lists from descriptor elements and properties, such as the relevant hosts and remote subsystems and controller information. And together, this is the information that the pre-OS driver needed to complete its network boot. And at this point, the system is ready to transition to the OS runtime. I do want to point out on this slide that an advantage uh, of the NBFT over the iSCSI boot firmware table is the ability to share namespaces other than just boot namespaces to the operating system. And this can include non-boot namespace data stores that you might want the system to be able to access for its assigned workloads. As discussed, the, the previous reference, uh, sorry, the public reference implementation is based on U, uh, UEFI EDK2. And the reference code was developed by a subset of the NBME boot task group members, which included Intel, Dell Technologies, NVIDIA, SUSE, Red Hat, HPE, and VMware. The reference code can be re retrieved at the, at the address that you see at the bottom there. Uh, and the code will be released under the BSD3 clause or you know, other open source licenses that's required by individual subcomponents. And Doug is going to take the microphone for a while to go into details about the UEFI boot sequence and what happens during booting over NVMe in a UEFI environment. And I will advance the slide. Take it away, Doug. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Hey, as Phil said, before we get into the details of the reference implementation itself, we think that you know a small primer on the UEFI boot process is probably appropriate. And during that, we'll narrate in. Uh, you know, where exactly boot from NVMe Fabrics fits into to these various phases and what was done. So the UEFI system spec defines several phases of the boot process. On this slide, we cover the seven primary phases uh, that are shown or seen in the, the common Tiano Core EDK2 implementation that's widely used today. This EDK2 implementation is what our proof of concept that we'll discuss has been based on. And the NVMe Express boot specification and the reference implementation affected several of these steps, uh, as I said, we're, we'll get into. The first primary phase after platform security is complete is the PEI phase. In PEI, amongst other things, initial configuration context is gathered. During this phase, boot attempt configuration that is stored in UEFI variables is then collected. That boot attempt configuration consists of the administrative configuration relevant to the pre-OS driver in, in the next phases, such as subsystem information like NQN IP addresses and security parameters. And it's important that for the later reestablishment of configuration context for the OS that there is consistency between these. In our reference implementation, some of this is currently saved with an EFI shell tool, which parses a config file and then writes it into the, the UEFI variables. In the future, there may be a more common UEFI user interface for config attempts or BMC-based approaches for uh, more distributed config management in larger data centers and fleets. PEI is followed by the driver execution environment or the Dixie phase. In Dixie, drivers for various devices and interfaces are loaded as protocols, and ultimately things such as NVMe over Fabrics Transport are given a block interface. This is where the primary new work for our reference implementation happened. This driver ultimately needs to be able to read the administrative context from the UEFI configuration and then set up new network connectivity to allow for connections to relevant NVMe Express subsystems. This is also where we finally gather the namespace specific information for population into the NBFT later. At the end of this phase of driver load is where the configuration for the NBFT are ultimately stored away to be accessed by the OS and the, as part of the ACPI NBFT table. Dixie is followed by the boot device selection or BDS phase. This is where a boot manager uh, with entries are usually matched up to EFI partitions via GUIDs. System policy controls which of these namespaces would be chosen as a boot device and what order that they're offered for booting by their EFI device path. That's kind of normal practice in, in this and not something we've, we've additionally touched. In some implementations such as EDK2, a boot manager or, or another selection screen is typically found in this phase. As you see on the picture on the left, boot managers usually help the user correlate the specifics of the device in question to a boot attempt. In this particular picture, you see our boot manager found an 
Endemure Fabrics messaging protocol with a Linux distribution attached on its block device, uh, the protocol represented by the block device. The boot device selection phase is then followed by the transit system load phase, which is really where the OS image is loaded and the UEFI to OS execution handover is performed or at least started. It's transient because UEFI may hand over that execution to another application or drivers during this phase. However, access to native connections that the UEFI Prios driver originally created is still entirely possible. This allows for a bootloader such as Grub to still interact with the NVMe over Fabrics devices that were previously attached without having to have their own driver present. It also means that TSL environments may not need to consume context from the ACPI MBFT since the configuration context already exists. It's also additionally possible for drivers and applications to still create new ACPI table entries or, or new tables altogether during this phase too, which we'll touch on a little bit later. But by the end of this phase, the MBFT has been generated or multiple MBFTs have been generated and are stored in memory for the runtime OS's access. Last, what we wanna cover is the runtime phase. Now that the OS can be loaded, the OS may choose to use NVFT data or its own existing configuration to establish or reestablish connectivity to devices configured during the pre-OS environment. Typically, a runtime and in runtime, an OS is now completely disconnected from pre-OS drivers such as in UEFI. At this point, the OS will need to choose to read the NVFT in order to set up appropriate networking interfaces like device selection, routing, and binding if it wants to reestablish that connectivity. The OS would also need to be uh, enabled to configure any authentication or discovery relative to that network and ultimately reconnect to the NVM subsystems in question. In runtime, there can also be some differences between consumption patterns of a typical OS versus, say, an installation environment for the handover and initialization in this phase. For instance, for a normal OS runtime, if the OS chooses to, it can use the NBFT and use the provided information in that MBFT as its own configuration. Or it may choose to utilize both local administrative configuration and a subset of content from the MBFT. However, for an OS installer, this can be pretty different. Even without a bootable namespace present, i.e. a case where boot device selection may have not actually found an EFI system partition, an OS installer may still need the data from the NBFT populated so that it can establish connection to a new boot device in addition to the locally administratively provided values during their installer. As previously alluded to, this is important uh, because this is where the NBFT will likely contain unconfigured namespaces that a UEFI BIOS may have marked otherwise unavailable to boot from. But still, this is crucial to successfully installing and loading an OS onto NVMe or Fabrics Media. This ultimately then allows for a single configuration management ecosystem to program the relevant configuration that may propagate to both pre-OS and OS drivers and its context, paving the way for future fleet management. Now, onto our reference implementation. This reference implementation is really needed to aid developers across the industry to enable a consistent boot over NVMe or Fabrics capability. Our reference implementation consists of both pre-OS and OS runtime software. In the pre-OS, a new UEFI driver for the TCP transport for EDK2 was developed. In the OS boot and runtime, a Linux reference implementation that exposes the NBFT and consumes the NBFT was developed that enables use by common OS tools. We'd like to start this discussion on the evolution of the POC architecture towards that reference implementation, and then go into the tools that were developed at, at, in support of booting NVMe or Fabrics along the way. This diagram attempts to show how the design evolved from an initial concept to the reference implementation that, that exists today. On the left, we show the originally proposed concept architecture before standardization. In green, on the left, were elements we believed could be leveraged from the existing ecosystem components when we had initial discussions with the, the ecosystem in the community. In blue were items we planned new development for as UEFI NVMe or Fabric behavior. 
in particular, we expected to leverage the implementation of Intramural Fabrics in SPDK within the EDK2 driver. Our initial concept was focused on just creating the basics for the driver itself and attempting to reuse those common community assets like SPDK so we didn't have to invent whole new stacks. On the right is the implement, uh, implemented architecture. What you can see here is what we modified uh, or, or how we modified and added existing components. Uh, on the right again, as the reference implementation evolved, we were actually able to develop an NVMe Fabrics library as a POSIX shim in EDK2 that made it possible to directly reuse the SBDK NVMe or Fabrics transport layer so that we didn't have to create yet another bespoke ecosystem implementation. For, for, for example, that would have required, you know, new associated interop and and other maintenance problems with that bespoke implementation um, this ultimately led us to be able to build an extensive edk2 driver to drive the framework around which those interfaces shown in brown could be reused uh, or, or or developed uh, from edk2 um, from the existing uefi interfaces that are present today uh, and, and I apologize, there's some carrying of the graphics here on the screen. In addition, as we were developing this pre-OS driver, we found that we needed a way to be able to manage and interact and test this environment more rapidly. From that, we created some configuration tools that made it easier to automate and interact with the UEFI pre-OS driver for testing. The primary new tool for pre-OS developers and administrators is the UEFI application called NVMe CLI that can be executed within a classic EFI shell. This command line tool was heavily inspired by Linux's NVMe CLI and was designed to facilitate the same basic configuration and diagnostics uh, that, that Linux has from its user space today and allowed us to test out a lot of our interoperability in, of the pre-OS reference driver. In some example cases we have here of the NVMe CLI command providing a list of known NVMe uh, over fabric devices that have been attached to their associated attributes. This includes their CNSO3 namespace unique identifier, which is a GUID, and the capacity of the namespace and model. Additionally, similar to the Linux command, we have an example of NVMe CLI's EFI connect attempt command, which supports similar arguments for connecting to remote NVMe over fabric devices from the, the CLI. It too has similar argument structure you may be familiar with today. And this really allowed for the specif uh, specification of um, you know, uh, subsystem target parameters like IP addresses, and subsystem NQN, and the other controller-specific parameters to be able to attach to the subsystems in question. This allows for a user to set up and man manipulate NVMe over block devices during that transient system load phase. But it's also useful for both developers and administrators alike to be able to connect to endpoints, create new block device connections on the fly, test those out, and debug them. Um, and for those connections ultimately to be booted from uh, from within the, the EFI shell. Leaving the pre-OS environment, we need to talk about the transition into the, a final OS runtime. For runtime, in a Linux reference implementation, there are three major areas of concern, platform, kernel, and user space. The majority of the new work on the right, shown in green, and the effort to support the reference implementation is actually in user space and leverages the existing ecosystem infrastructure in blue. In the middle today, the Linux kernel exposes the MBFT from ACPI via the SysFS interface to ACPI. User space tools then, starting with extensions to libNVMe and NVMe CLI, then allow for the exporting and consuming of that MBFT content. Systems management tools, such as Drake it or EFI boot management, even system D can then get a standard representation from NVMe CLI or lib NVMe libraries and use them to generate NVMe over fabric con configuration to be able to reconnect to the, the subsystems and namespaces ultimately, uh, you know, as normal. All this development has been done using standard KVM KEMU workflows uh, using EDK2 OVMF um, from the pre OS code available today. And that means that an individual developer can simulate both uh, a remote NVMe or fabric subsystem, i.e. a target of their boot environments namespaces or the host of those namespaces and the, the booting application from, uh, you know, from a single developer's instance. Uh, 
As was previously mentioned, for our Linux reference implementation, we also had to modify tools like NVMe over uh, NVMe CLI to support the, the NBFT. These changes are being proposed and adopted within the upstream so that the future structure of those commands may slightly change. Shown here are some examples of the output from that reference implementation showing a show NBFT command. This command has both tabular human output and a JSON output that displays the contents of the, from BIOS in the NBFT. This particular example shows two namespaces that are present on multiple controllers of a single NVMe or fabric subsystem that was found via its discovery controller by that pre-OS driver. You'll also notice that the command supported reading custom NBFT objects in, which is also really useful for developers testing permutations of that pre-OS administrative config. As I previously said, the show MBFT output also supports a structured machine-friendly JSON output that you can easily parse with tools like JQ. This output shows all of the MBFT descriptors in their natural order without human-centric decoding and colonization. As you can see, see in this example, the MBFT starts off with the required host descriptor, then followed by a subsystem descriptor records. Next, it's followed by the HFI or, or the host transport interface, and lastly, the discovery structure which contains the relevant discovery controllers that are part of the detail. So as we said, this reference implementation, it's, it's the result of a lot of different work coming together. Our proof of concept for NVMe or Fabrics, it's initially based on the OpenSUSE distribution and work is also ongoing to port it to other distributions such as Fedora. This work is both important and useful because the details of OS bring up strongly differ from distribution to distribution, and it requires a lot more community involvement. For instance, today, uh, for that OpenSUSE image, the minimal prerequisites are an OpenSUSE image, of course, uh, a Linux host with a working KVM QEU, uh, QEMU setup, uh, virtual networking on that host, and some sort of NVMe over Fabric subsystem as a, as a storage device. And this could still be just another QEMU uh, virtual machine running NVMe T2. And that should be enough for the typical developer to be able to get started with interoperability for this environment. The reference implementation proves out the functionality of NVMe boot specifications by enabling booting over NVMe devices over NVMe TCP. However, it doesn't implement all of the features of the specification, and the specification is continuing to evolve with new features and new capabilities. Examples of enhancements to the reference design uh, that the community would like to invite involvement to help develop include, but certainly aren't limited to, a human interface infrastructure tool for performing the initial configuration tasks, uh, support for authentication and TLS as defined in the NVMe family specifications for booting of NVMe devices, uh, supporting of credential exchange using the NV of, uh, the DMTF Redfish Secrets Registry that I described a bit ago. And of course, additional OS and, and installer support. And that's for the reference limitation. For the specification, uh, as it standardized the basic constructs to booting over NVMe and NVMe or fabrics, but more, more needs to be done. Uh, for instance, we'd like to investigate booting over additional transports above and beyond TCP. We'd like to see work done on big data namespace qu uh, quantity management in large fleets that Doug alluded to. We'd like to see more multi-path topology examples, uh, support for device tree, and setting up of NVMe or Fabrics boot in, uh, entries in the OS itself. And I think Doug's going to take it away with how, uh, how one might, uh, might add new transports. Yeah. As Phil said, our last topic really before wrapping up, we'd like to talk about the ease in which supporting additional transports may be in the future and how easy it would be for contributions to come to the spec for new transports. As we, we said earlier, the MBFT contains a transport specific descriptor from which we've outlined as a template in the NVMe Express boot specification. To support an additional transport, it's necessary to only add transport sp specific accoutrements to the NBFT's HFI transport info descriptor. There's a minor mandatory header as part of the HFI transport uh, internal descriptors today, and then other descriptors such as flags and configuration context is also needed. For example, from TCP today, those HFI constructs are things such as MAC address, VLANs, IP addresses, and gateways. These are the, really the minimal things that are required in order to establish connectivity from a host to an NVMe subsystem. 
and keep in mind that if a transport doesn't already have an existing implementation in the Endream Express transport specs, UEFI or elsewhere, then extensions may also be needed there too. With that, we really want to thank you for your time and invite everyone to come in and join the community and help us continue to evolve the ecosystem. As always, if you would like to see any of the specifications we've discussed here today or the reference implementations, see the links provided above. Um, thank you so much now, and we'll, um, we'll begin with a little bit of a, a Q&A. Thank Great. Um, perfect. So the first question here is, um, why didn't you choose to extend the existing EDK to NVMe driver rather than write a new driver? I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, you know, we really wanted to avoid disrupting the existing driver and its ecosystem. It, it's pretty well tested today and widely known and used. However, the existing driver does not include SGL support, scatter gather list support. Uh, if we wanted to add NVMe over fabric support to it, that would have required some re-architecting of it with that SGL support. And we really felt that the interoperability ecosystem would be at risk. And there were already separate drivers for different SCSI drive classes today uh, that existed in kind of multiple phases. So it really seemed reasonable to create a network package driver for engineer fabrics in the same fashion. Can you boot multiple servers from a single NVMe namespace or a single OS image? I'll, I'll take this one again. Um, it, that's a complicated question. So, so there's nothing um, in the standard that would prohibit uh, two separate hosts with separate host NQNs from, uh, from being able to attach to a single namespace. And then thereby you can absolutely boot from them using this, uh, th this boot st uh, standardization. Uh, but but that, that assumes then that um, e either you've manage the, you know, the nature of read, write, or, you know, concurrent read, write support to that namespace or, you know, manage concurrency in some other way. So if you can, uh, if you can hold your namespace as immutable, like, you know, read only, or you've got a snapshotting mechanism in your storage subsystem, then that uh, may lend itself to, uh, to utilizing a single OS image better. And certainly there are people that are, that are trying to do that. So the simple answer is yes. Yeah. Next question, how is NVMe over TCP boot handled in case of a network disruption? Um, so for example, say that 100 plus nodes are being booted using NVMe over TCP. When the network is recovered from disruption, all 100 plus nodes will try to boot at the same time, creating huge network overload. Um, how would you handle this? Well, I suppose that that starts out with, depending on your, your infrastructure, your, your transport congestion, capabilities and the NVMe over Fabrics target itself for how it handles multiple people trying to connect to it all at once. Um, Doug or Rob, maybe you have a more nuanced answer to that. Also, it de depends on how much bandwidth you have in your in your network, right? If it's a, a small one gig Ethernet network, maybe some issues if it's- You, you might know, be in trouble there. <laughs> yeah, 100 gig, uh, you, you're probably, you know, again, it's gonna depend on how um, the network is set up for congestion control and, and whatnot, as well as, as um, Phil said, the, the array that you're booting from. But there's a lot of factors there. But in general, it, it should, um, you know, it, it's done all the time with uh, other technologies. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that that if, uh, if your network is already capable of supporting those 100 plus nodes concurrently uh, reading and writing from, you know, from namespaces on that, that shared fabric, then you know, in theory, it should be should be okay. But you know, as as both Rob and Phil alluded to, that that involves some planning, and congestion management. Uh, you know, there's there's some upfront work that has to be done. And I guess that, that I might finish that up by saying, you know, if, if you do have multiple multiple fabric instances or multiple fabric types that go to the that that particular namespace, you might be in good shape. Uh, this is a lot of great work. Do you have any ballpark on when it will hit server firmwares as a boot option? Well, we do have a number of, of uh, members of the boot task group um, involved in, in developing in the firmware. I don't, I haven't heard from any of them of when they're planning on producing uh, implementations. But if you look at the players, right, we had HP, we had Dell, um, and the operating system side, we had um, 
Red Hat and SUSE and VMware. So they wouldn't be putting time into it if they didn't plan to bring it to market. Right. We've got Micron, IBM, we've got a lot of folks. Yeah, I didn't mean to leave anybody out. Yeah, no, I mean, no. I wasn't. Yeah, exactly. I'm just saying for all, all, ed all edges of that answer. <laughs> no hate mail, please. <laughs> <laughs> Um, has this solution considered supporting um, SED drives? Um, so since all we're doing is implementing the the support for the the boot information and configuration exchange, there's uh, there's nothing barring uh, all of the other features of the the. NVMe Express ecosystem being present in the drivers. It just requires, you know, development around those features. And that's a great place for, you know, community and ecosystem cooperation around, uh, you know, making sure we've got good, uh, you know, uh, uh, interoperable drivers there. And so again, you know, big plug for, you know, come join the ecosystem. How does this framework relate to PXE boot? Is it some kind of subset of PXE? Um, so, much like with iSCSI, this is an alternative to, to yeah. Pixie. Uh, you know, if you think about classic UEFI boot environment, um, the EDK2 network package supports uh, boot targets such as Pixie or HTTP boot or iSCSI and now, uh, you know, NVMe over Fabrics. Uh, so this is, this is kind of a, um, a sibling in the realm of boot protocols. Um, there's certainly some interoperability with Pixie that you can you, know, you could envision here too if you so desire. Do you expect network boot to change how compute and storage servers are architected in the future? Uh, I mean, I'll jump in as a fan of you know choose your own adventure disaggregated architectures that um, uh, you know network boot is. Um, is a nice tool in the toolbox for, um, you know, giving administrators and, you know, IT operations teams the flexibility to choose where they want, uh, you know, their storage and locality and management uh, and, and allows for, you know, more centralized or distributed control, uh, you know, centralization of storage itself and distribution of that control plane. Uh, I don't know, Robert, Phil, if you've got thoughts here too. No, that works. What requirements do you see evolving for boot devices and data centers today? Must I say that again? Sorry, it was what requirements do you see evolving for boot devices and data centers today? Not sure I understand the question, but I can start and maybe maybe people can pick it up. So I'm seeing a lot of, of work in, in composable data centers where maybe servers don't have boot drives or dry or drive space they want to they want to dedicate to booting. Uh, and then this would be simply a way to add, add that capability. And also, if you know, have work with dynamic data centers with dynamic work dynamic workloads, uh, you might want different OS images built for for various purposes. Uh, but you know, even even the same OS version with with different namespace uh, provisioning. Uh, and so when you you could you know, I want this name, I want this workload, and I want these data stores. We'll boot this particular OS image. Oh, and it, by the way, it provides the namespaces that I care about for the data sets uh, that I'm going to use for that workload. What I would add to that is uh, think about the density improvements you could make on servers in Iraq if you removed the the um, disks that are there, not only for booting, but also for the local storage. So if you just have a couple of all flash arrays for redundancy, you know, two of them, two data paths, et cetera, you could have the those servers that have little or no boot capability um, at booting off the network in, within that rack to avoid the congestion that we talked about earlier. Um, you, they could also have all their storage capabilities in within that rack over a you know, 100 gig or higher network. And that, in, that allows that data center to put a lot more dense servers into that rack. So there you go, it adds to the density, it also adds to the flexibility. Precisely, yeah. Is there a path to interoperate with CXL devices? 
think that's a broader NVMe question um, for CXL memory, I assume you're talking about. Um, Doug, or Rob, I don't have an answer here. Yeah. Uh, I would say you're right. It's a broader question, but assuming that the standards um, synchronization occurred, like we've said and had a slide on, we can add more transports easily to um, this um, boot spec. Yep, uh, I agree. As soon as as soon as we've got well defined, you know, transport and interoperability on CXL with uh, with NVMe in a formal manner, that that'll be really easy to extend the, uh, the the boot specification to support it. You mentioned reuse of SPDK. What are the impacts of SPDK? Um, we we did have to make some changes to to SPDK, but they were really primarily focused on compilation compatibility. Um, really, SPDK is already pretty modular. Right. And likewise, EDK2 has its own TCP stack and, and you know, uh, uh, sockets and, and IP implementation that we reused. And so we just had to develop interfaces there. Uh, so the changes to the SPDK were largely because EDK2 must also support compilation with things like MSVC and MSVC uh, has troubles with some of the, the GCC and Clang style macros that SPDK has today. Um, so, you know, this may be further streamlined in the future for better maintainability, but they were kind of necessary right now. Um, and they're a goal yeah. really longer terms to work with the upstream community here. All right, and, and we did invite the some of the developers on SBDK to come and look at what we've done and what we've done to their thing. And, and they, they seemed remarkably happy with how it worked out together. And by the way, some of those developers from SBDK were also working on uh, our um, reference uh, yeah. implementation. Great. Um, well, that was actually the last question that we received. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, these slides will be available on the NVMe Express website and a recording of this webinar will be available on YouTube and on the NVMe Express Bright Talk channel. Um, thank you to our presenters and for every and everybody who joined us today.